within our lives, oh Lord. A generation longs for you to move. We pray for you to move. It's time for you to move. Oh, rise. Oh, rise. Testing one, two. Good evening, everyone. Let's uh, take a seat. Let's get ready to get into our study for this evening. You can open up your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 50. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> excuse me, we've got three more chapters to go. Uh, Two of them are enormous. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a moment. <clears throat> um, so, Lord willing, we're going to finish one of them tonight. I don't know if I can be ambitious enough to think that we're going to finish two next week, but I may actually try. So, <clears throat> Lord willing, we'll have either two or three weeks left in Jeremiah, then we're going to be done. So it is my plan, when we have finished Jeremiah, I'm going to be doing a, uh, a little series on what I'm going to call devotional musings. Now you know what a devotional is, and hopefully you know what a musing is. A musing is just uh, something that you think about over and over in your mind, and uh, something that you, um, and a devotional musing would just be simply a uh, uh, a short, I don't want to call it sermonette because sermonette implies something that might be only five or ten minutes long, but what I would like to do is just a s series of very short one sermon devotionals on a variety of topics. And I've already got uh, a few topics rolling around in my mind. I've already started writing down some scripture verses that we're going to be looking at. And so what I've got written down so far is I want to, and this isn't necessarily in the order I'm going to do it, um, we're going to talk about anxiety, we're going to talk about fear, we're going to talk about salvation, what that means, we're going to talk about faith, we're going to deal with the topic of lust, we're going to talk about guarding the tongue, we're going to talk about prayer, and maybe even a few more things. So that's what we're going to be, Lord willing, what we're going to be doing once we wrap up this series on Jeremiah. But for tonight, we're still in Jeremiah. So let's get our Bibles open to Jeremiah 50. <clears throat> let's pray together and let's get into this. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for a really, really good time of song and praise and adoration. Lord, thank you for those songs. Thank you, Lord God, for the richness of the doctrinal content. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of so many of your attributes. And thank you, Lord, that we get to sing about those things to you, <clears throat> that we get to lift them up and uh, hold them up as a banner Lord, we stand tonight on the solid ground of your word. We stand this evening on the solid ground of the reality of who you are, what salvation is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is. There's so many things, Lord, that we, that we embrace as foundational, that we love to sing about, we love to proclaim to other people about. Tonight, Lord, we pray that as, as we look into the Old Testament and as we go through a chapter of judgment, Lord, we know that we'll be reminded once again of those things that we hold to as foundational. As we see your dealings with people who 
disregarded what you said is foundational. It gives us the opportunity to be sobered, to be humbled. So Lord, would you please just let your spirit teach us tonight and let your word cause us to hunger for more of you and more of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 50. <clears throat> the next two chapters, as I said, are enormous. <laughs> and both of these chapters focus on the judgment that God is going to bring against ancient Babylon. 110 verses devoted to the destruction of Babylon. Almost as many verses as the previous oracles to the other nations combined, which is sort of indicative of the extent to which Babylon dominated the thinking and lives of the people of Jeremiah's day. But it would be wrong to view this chapter or these chapters as focusing solely on Babylon. There are two themes pursued here in an interlinked fashion. Though Babylon had been divinely assigned the role of being the Lord's destroyer of the other nations, Babylon itself would be called to account by the Lord for her conduct and would in turn be subject to conquest and destruction. Even though they were used by the Lord as his instrument of punishment, Babylon did not possess any special exemption from design, divine scrutiny of her conduct. But now, linked to the theme of Babylon's overthrow is that of the deliverance of the Lord's people, and we'll see that in these two chapters. This too testifies to the universal sovereignty of the Lord and also to his gracious provision for his own. This is the true climax to Jeremiah's prophecy. Not just the destruction of all that is opposed to God, but the rescue through his grace of a remnant that the Lord acknowledges as his own. So on the one hand, we're looking at the destruction of Babylon and we're saying, whoa, boy, are they gonna get it. We've already seen how Israel, how Judah was gonna get it. But Jeremiah is also given the privilege to be able to enlarge on the theme of restoration after judgment. The same kind of thing that we find in some of the other prophetic books. And that is the restoration of Israel. And that's going to be speckled throughout. Now I suppose I should offer up a few historical tidbits about Babylon. I did with Edom, Ammon, the other nations, countries that we've already covered. Babylon itself was an ancient city-state. Some of you may know that it was located near the Euphrates River in what is, now, what is known today as Iraq. The name Babylon is derived by the Hebrews from a root word that means to confound, to confuse. And it has its reference to the confusion of tongues at the Tower of Babel or Babel or Babel, <laughs> however it's properly pronounced, I'll say Babel, at the Taber Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. The biblical account ascribes the founding of the ancient city of Babylon to the descendants of Cush and the followers of a man by the name of Nimrod. But it wasn't until about 1830 BC that the city began its rise to prominence. In the ensuing struggle with surrounding city-states, Babylon eventually conquered a city called Larsa. And then the first dynasty of Babylon was established. There were many dynasties 
after that. There were many well-known kings in its early history. But the city of Babylon did not reach the height of its glory until the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar made the city of Babylon, Babylon splendid and the king's own inscriptions are, large, are concerned largely with his vast building operations. Nebuchadnezzar's brilliant city included vast fortifications, very famous streets, canals, temples, palaces. There was a gate called the Ishtar Gate which led through the double wall of fortifications and it was adorned with rows of bulls and dragons in colored enameled brick, very ornate, very beautiful. Nebuchadnezzar's throne room was likewise adorned with these enameled bricks. Nebuchadnezzar built what's famously referred to as the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which to the Greeks were considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. How well the, the words of Daniel in Daniel 4.30 fit the ambitious builder Nebuchadnezzar. When Nebuchadnezzar said, is this not Babylon the great which I myself have built as a royal residence by the power, by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty. <laughs> That's what he said to, to, to himself after Daniel had warned him. We'll talk about that later on. But what led to its destruction is something that we're going to be talking about as we th read through these two very large chapters. Now there is of course one more thing to take note of and this has to do with how the name Babylon is used throughout scripture as a type of evil religious system and confusion in general. Babylon, the name, the word Babylon carries a figurative meaning of the confusion into which the whole social order of the world has fallen under through false religions. Maybe you've heard of the phrase Babylonian mystery, mystery religion. That phrase is actually a common way of referring to a vast number of pagan religious systems that were antithetical to anything having to do with the true and living God. Ever since the time of the Tower of Babel, Babylon, was, Babylon has represented the world system that man builds in defiance of God. The name Babylon is synonymous with the pride and the wickedness of governments and nations, pagan governments and nations. It's a type of the worst kind of human government and a symbol of the power of darkness that seeks to enslave and oppress people. Any world power that rises up in defiance of God is following in the footsteps of Babylon, which was characterized by its, its self-inflating, hostile defiance of God and its brutal opposition or oppression of other people groups. Nebuchadnezzar was the case in point. In the New Testament, Babylon prefigures apostate Christendom. That is, ecclesiastical Babylon, the great harlot referred to in Revelation chapter 17. But it also prefigures political Babylon which eventually destroys ecclesiastical or religious Babylon. The power of political Babylon is eventually destroyed by the glorious second advent of Jesus Christ. Consequently, the destruction of Babylon in the passages that we're about to look at is also a picture of God's final judgment that's coming upon 
the political, economic, and religious Babylonian system that will be in place at some point during the Great Tribulation period. So we're going to see many correlations between ancient Babylon and the Babylon that the Lord Jesus is going to destroy when he comes back. It's hard to miss those parallels as we read through some of this, especially in chapter 51, which we're probably not going to get to tonight. So let's pick it up, chapter 50, verse 1. There's a little bit of background for you on Babylon. Verse 1, beginning to read. The word which the Lord spoke concerning Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans, through the prophet, through Jeremiah the prophet, declare and proclaim among the nations, proclaim it and lift up a standard. Do not conceal it, but say... Babylon has been captured, Bel has been put to shame, Marduk has been shattered, her images have been put to shame, her idols have been shattered. For a nation has come up against her out of the north. It will make her land an object of horror, and there will be no inhabitant in it. Both man and beast have wandered off, they have gone away. So here, just in the first few verses, Immediately, we are made to understand that Babylon would be brought to nothing. Verse 2 mentions Bel and Marduk. Bel or Marduk, perhaps. Bel and Marduk are two renderings of the same Babylonian deity. This was Babylon's chief deity among many other deities that they have. And basically, verse 2 is saying that Yahweh is going to put to shame their false hopes that they have in their false gods. And he's even going to bring down the images that represent these gods. God says they're going to come crashing down. In verse 3, the reference there to the nation of the north is a likely reference to the Medo-Persian Empire, which eventually would bring Babylon to its knees. Verses 4 and 5, continuing on, In those days and at that time, declares the Lord, the sons of Israel will come, both they and the sons of Judah as well. They will go along, weeping as they go, and it will be the Lord their God they will seek. For they will ask for the way to Zion, turning their faces in its direction. They will come that they may join themselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will not be forgotten. Now, we know that in the future, Israel is going to turn to the Lord. But more than likely, these references here are referring to the exiles of Judah and Israel that are eventually going to go back to their land. They would not continue to be captives in Babylon. And the fulfillment of these verses, I think, is reflected in Psalm 126, which says this. It's very short. When the Lord brought back the captive ones of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those that sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. He who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. And that's clearly what we see here in verses 4 and 5. They're going to once again join themselves to the Lord, They're going to be wanting to turn their faces to Zion again, weeping as they go, and it will be the Lord their God they will seek. So in other words, all of the effect of what it was like to go through Babylonian captivity and even Medo-Persian captivity, all of that's going to be wiped away because of the, the prospect of what's coming as they go and resettle there in the land of Israel. Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, all the different groups uh, we've already covered that when we covered when we uh, did our study in Ezra and Nehemiah. Continuing on, verse six. Now 
My people have become lost. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have made them turn aside in the mountains. They have gone along from mountain to hill and they have forgotten their resting place. All who came upon them have devoured them and their adversaries have said, we are not guilty inasmuch as they have sinned against the Lord who is the habitation of righteousness, even the Lord, the hope of their fathers. So in other words, here, the, the, uh, even though the people have, have become basically prey for the wolves, the testimony of their captors was, in verse 7, it's nobody's fault but theirs. Uh, they've sinned against their Lord, who's the habitation of righteousness. Therefore, we've come down on them because of what they've done to their Lord. And this was the arrogant attitude that they had toward the people of God, thinking, well, these people deserve it anyway. Now, it's going to get interesting here in just a few moments, but that's the mindset here. Continuing on verse 8. Wander away from the midst of Babylon and go forth from the land of the Chaldeans. Be also like the male goats at the head of the flock. So here, this is speaking, to, referring to Israel about what they should do. For behold, I am going to arouse and bring up against Babylon a horde of great nations from the land of the north, and they will draw up their battle lines against her. For there they shall be, she will be taken captive. Their arrows will be like an expert warrior who does not return empty-handed. Chaldee will become plunder, and all who plunder her will have enough, declares the Lord. In other words, they're going to they're gonna satisfy themselves with the spoils of Babylon. And so this is a preparatory warning to the people of God of what's coming upon Babylon. Now, of course, the Israelites had already been told that their captivity was going to be 70 years. Daniel knew that. Daniel, who was already in Babylon at this time, he knew that the cap captivity of Israel was going to be 70 years. Jeremiah prophesied that the captivity was going to be 70 years. If, with it, if any discerning individual was among the ranks of the Israelites, they would have known this, this is only going to last 70 years. Verse 11. It continues, because you are glad, because you are jubilant, O oh, you who pillage my heritage, because you skip about like a threshing heifer and neigh like stallions, your mother will be greatly ashamed. She who gave you birth will be humiliated. Behold, she will be the least of the nations, a wilderness, a parched land, and a desert. Because of the indignation of the Lord, she will not be inhabited, but she will be completely desolate. Everyone who passes by Babylon will be horrified and will hiss because of all her wounds. Draw up your battle lines against Babylon on every side, all you who bend the bow. Shoot at her. Do not be sparing with your arrows, for she has sinned against the Lord. Raise your battle cry against her on every side. She has given herself up. Her pillars have fallen. Her walls have been torn down. For this is the vengeance of the Lord. Take vengeance on her. On her. As she has done to others, so do to her. Cut off the sower from Babylon and the one who wields the sickle at the time of harvest from the sword of the oppressor. They will each turn back to his own people and they will each flee to his own land. Now let me just stop there for a moment and look back just very quickly at what began the first verse of this section where it says, because you are glad, because you are jubilant, O you who pillage my heritage, because you skip about like a threshing heifer and neigh like stallions. What this is referring to is the fact that Babylon had been almost giddy over their subjugation of God's people. Now there's a verse in Proverbs 17, verse five, that says this, he who mocks the poor taunts his maker and he who rejoices at calamity will not go unpunished. Now, I'll focus on this a little bit more later on, but let me just throw out there, 
God was not about to let the Babylonians go unpunished. I said that in the introduction. Keep in mind that when the, as the Babylonians were going through and just annihilating, annihilating everything in their path, there was this sense of just being overjoyed at what they were being allowed, what they were accomplishing. But what they weren't taking into account was that these were God's people. <laughs> they, they, they weren't taking into account that these people that they were threshing, as they were threshing like a heifer, uh, these were God's people. And so now God is saying concerning them, what you dished out, you're about to get, you're about to take. You know, if you can't dish it out, if you can't take it, don't dish it out, that kind of a thing. Well, they were about to take a lot. So continuing on, verse 17. It says, again, Israel is a scattered flock. The lions have driven them away. Excuse me here. The lions have driven them away. <clears throat> the first one who devoured him was the king of Assyria. And this last one who has broken his bones is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Therefore, thus says the, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I'm going to punish the king of Babylon and his land just as I punished the king of Assyria. And I will bring Israel back to his pasture and he will graze on Carmel and Bashan and his desire will be satisfied in the hill country of Ephraim and Gilead. In those days and at that time, declares the Lord, search will be made for the iniquity of Israel, but there will be none. And for the sins of Judah, but they will not be found. For I will pardon those whom I leave as a remnant. Now, stopping there for a moment. We can recall the many passages in the book of Isaiah that references the Assyrian aggression against Israel. They too were used by God, but they too became very haughty. Here he's saying the same thing about Babylon. So is this, are we to understand, is, are we to understand that on the one hand, God commanded Babylon to destroy, destroy Israel completely. And now he's telling Babylon that they're going to be judged for it? Yep. That's exactly what he's saying. God using them as his tool does not nullify the responsibility that they have to humble themselves before God. Their failure to recognize God's hand in giving them this world-dominating power was going to cause the tables to be turned against them. Keep in mind, remember, Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar when King Neb Nebuchadnezzar had that dream and Daniel was brought in to interpret that dream from him, for him. Remember that? Daniel said to him, as he's interpreting the dream, he said, the tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, in which, uh, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt and, who, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. That tree is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. But then he said to him, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord the king, that you will be driven away from mankind 
and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field, and you be given grass to eat like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and, dis- and bestows it on whoever he w- whomever he wishes. So Nebuchadnezzar is going to be accountable for not recognizing that? Absolutely yes. Definitely yes. That will be the case for the gentleman who's ruling in North Korea. Mr. Little Potbelly over there who just, I mean, the guy looks like an egg. Does, does, is, oh man, you shouldn't say stuff like that. Why? He's a tyrant. He's a bully. And God's gonna cut, his, cut him off at the feet if he doesn't repent. The Lord's gonna stop the man. Eventually, uh, he could carry on for decades more. I don't know. But he's gonna be brought down. And all of the world leaders that have this, this attitude toward the people of God in any country where Christianity is being crushed, those are God's people. You don't think God's gonna deal with that eventually? Now, I know he's gonna deal with it ultimately. We know Jesus is gonna come back and he's gonna deal with it ultimately. But until the Lord returns, God is gonna bring them down. Nebuchadnezzar was no different. These were the people of God. God used him for a season to bring his own people down to chasten them. He did. This was legitimate. They were his legitimate tool and judgment begins in the house of God. The Lord may use these pagan nations to judge his own church today. Yes, he does do that. But there is a line they can cross. We don't know where that line is. But there is a line they can cross, and only God knows. And then he begins to move on them. Here, God is moving on Babylon, ancient Babylon. Look at what he says next in verse 21. Against the land of Marathaim, Go up against it and against the inhabitants of Pecod, all areas of Babylon. Slay and utterly destroy them, declares the Lord, and do according to all that I've commanded you. The noise of battle is in the land and great destruction. How the hammer of the whole earth has been cut off and broken. How Babylon has become an object of horror among the nations. Imagine that, the hammer of the earth. Boy, were they a hammer. And it was even said of God himself that Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, you have dominion over the world like no one else, no world leader has ever had. You're a hammer. You're a tree. Verse 24, he he says, I've set, I've set, excuse me, I've set a snare for you And you were also caught, O Babylon, while you you, yourself were not aware. You have been found and also seized because you have engaged in conflict with the Lord. So the Lord has opened his armory and has brought forth the weapons of his indignation. For it is a work of the Lord God of hosts in the land of the Chaldeans. So the Lord is saying, look, you guys... You Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, you've, you've carried on in a particular way, but what you don't understand, what you're not, you're not getting, is that I have brought you into a place of capture. I've snared you. And I've set this snare of you. You're, you're not aware of it. You've been found. You've been seized. And the reason is, is because you're engaged in conflict with the Lord. You're now fighting against God. And so he's opened his armory. That's scary, isn't it? Think about that. What kind of armory does God have? 
Now in this case, the, army, the, the armory consisted of human beings and human weaponry. But you see, the reason they become now the, armor, the army of God is because they're, they have God's blessing. They're going to be used by God. And if they're being used by God, there's no army that's going to be able to defeat them because God is for them because they're going to be accomplishing what he wants them to accomplish. The potential of any tool that's in God's hands is limitless. There's, there's no boundary that can withstand it. So they cannot lose. Verse 26. Come to her from the farthest border. Open up her barns. Pile her up like heaps and utterly destroy her. Let nothing be left to her. Put all her young bulls to the sword. Let them go down to the slaughter. Woe be upon them, for their day has come. The time of their punishment. And we've seen a lot of this language before. I think we get that. Not much commentary needed. Verse 28. There is a sound of fugitives and refugees from the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God. Vengeance for his temple. So clearly God is reckoning with Babylon for having burned his temple in her capture of Jerusalem. Now God said that was going to happen. But see, now God's judging them for their fury, the fury that they unleashed toward him and his people. The escapees from Babylon will announce in Zion that the Lord has avenged the destruction of his temple is what this is saying. Now, if you think about it, think about the witness of Daniel. Think about all the time that Nebuchadnezzar had with Daniel. Think about the fact that Daniel, I mean, here was a guy, a statesman, a righteous man of God, who never let down, at least not according to the biblical text, never let down his conviction for God, even as he was serving at the right hand of the king of Babylon. Think about that testimony that Nebuchadnezzar understood. Nebuchadnezzar, when, when Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Nebuchadnezzar had a first-hand witness from Daniel that the God of heaven, Yahweh himself, was telling Nebuchadnezzar, this is what's coming. Nebuchadnezzar fully understood that the God of, ba of Daniel was entirely different from the Babylonian gods. None of his wise men could figure out these riddles and these dreams that Nebuchadnezzar was being challenged with, except that one guy, that Daniel guy. And so Daniel would come in, hearing from the God of heaven. And Nebuchadnezzar was faced with that truth. And so not, it's not just some passive thing when these kinds of, of judgments are coming against Babylon because we have to understand that, that Nebuchadnezzar was sinning against great light, a lot of light. Doesn't that make you think about the United States? I mean, I mean you, don't think, you don't think that President Barack Obama knows that the Bible says that homosexuality is a sin? You don't think he understands? You don't think he knows, has the general knowledge that one of the Ten Commandments is thou shall not kill and that murder, or excuse me, that abortion is a violation of that commandment? You don't think he understands that? You don't think he has the head knowledge of that? You don't think all the people that make the laws that, that come against the laws of God, you don't think they have a basic Biblical knowledge of that? Of course they do. He knows that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for the sin. He may not actually, he obviously doesn't believe it the way we might believe that, but he has that knowledge. He has that working knowledge. He, well, he even professes that he is a Christian. So there's a lot of things to think about when we, when we think about, man, oh man, look at, 
look at what the Lord is doing to the nation of Babylon, the, and we understand about the accountability that Nebuchadnezzar have, we have to stop and go, wait a minute, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for this country? Do we not have that, that same level of knowledge that they had? Well, we have it way more than they did. We understand these things very, very well. And, and yet we just keep allowing godless ethics, godless standards to rule the land, to give them rights, to equate them with other people groups that have certain rights. Wow, that should cause us to take a step back and get, man, Lord, forgive us as a country. Verse 29, we're almost done here. Summon against Babylon all those who bend the bow and camp against her on every side. Let there be no escape. Repay her according to her work, according to all that she's done. So do to her, for she has become again Arrogant against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. There's that theme again. Arrogant against the Lord. Therefore her young men will fall in her streets and all her men of war will be silenced in that day, declares the Lord. Behold, I am against you, O arrogant one, declares the Lord God of hosts. For your day has come, the time will I will punish you. The arrogant one will stumble and fall with no one to raise him up. And I will set fire to his cities and it will devour all his environs. So here we see archers are summoned to encamp around Babylon to ensure that no one would escape. The city had to be destroyed because she had defied the Lord with her haughtiness. She was going to be punished for her pride as God vowed to kindle a fire that would consume her. See, the, the pride is what is being emphasized here. God is emphasizing Babylon's haughtiness by calling her there in verse 31, the arrogant, oh, arrogant one. It's like Jesus saying as he did, oh, foolish one. Oh, hypocrite. That's such a personal thing. I mean, if I were to say to one of my children, you know, oh, foolish child, I wouldn't be saying that as a joke. I would be making the, a direct correlation between their behavior and the word that I'm using, calling them out, singling them out as being uniquely guilty of the accusation I'm bringing against them. Oh, oh arrogant one. Your day has come. Verse 33, thus says the Lord of hosts, the sons of Israel are oppressed and the sons of Judah as well and all who took them captive have held them fast. They have refused to let them go. But then verse 40, 34 says, their redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He will vigorously plead their case so that he may bring rest to the earth but turmoil to the inhabitants of Babylon. A sword against the Chaldeans, declares the Lord, and against the inhabitants of Babylon, and against her officials and her wise men. A sword, a sword against the oracle priests, and they will become fools. A sword against her mighty men, and they will be shattered. A sword against their horses, and against their chariots, and against all their foreigners who are in the midst of her, and they will become women. A sword against her treasures, and they will be plundered, a drought on her waters, and they will be dried up, for it is a land of idols. And they are mad over fearsome idols. So going back just very quickly to verse 33, here, or verse 34, excuse me, here we can see the, the language of God being the kinsman redeemer of Israel. Of course, the Old Testament concept of kinsman redeemer would be perhaps lost on the Babylonians. But the Old Testament concept of kinsman redeemer, 
I can't say those two words very fast, excuse me. <laughs> kinsman redeemer, kinsman redeemer. Try to say that 20 times real fast or 10 times. <laughs> but the, the, the concept of, of kinsman redeemer includes the protection of a relative's person and property. It involves avenging the murder of a relative, the purchase of his alienated property, and or the marriage to his widow. The kinsman redeemer is voluntarily committed to champion Israel's cause according to this. He's about to bring peace to his own, but unrest to their oppressors. And so this is an amazing testimony. God saying, I'm coming to rescue my, my property. I'm coming to ransom it out of your hands. Note also, particularly verses 35 and 36, the word against their wise men, against their priests. Listen to, to Isaiah 47, 12. This was also a prophecy against Babylon. Stand fast now in your spells and in your many sorceries with which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you may cause trembling. You are wearied with your many counsels. Let now your astrologers, those who prophesy by the stars, those who predict by the new moons, stand up and save you from what will come upon you. Daniel, or Nebuchadnezzar, of course, had all of these advisors, and all they were was just a bunch of soothsayers trying to discern the times through soothsaying, trying to read the stars, read the heavens to determine the path maybe Nebuchadnezzar should go on. They were blind guides. God was saying, none of that's gonna matter. Your counselors aren't gonna matter. I'm gonna destroy all their counsel, and my counsel's gonna stand. They couldn't help Nebuchadnezzar before, and that's why Daniel had to be brought in. Verse 39. We're almost done here. <clears throat> Therefore, the desert creatures will live there along with the jackals. The ostriches will also live in it, and it will never again be inhabited or dwell in from generation to generation as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah with its neighbors, declares the Lord, no man will live there, nor will any son of man reside in it. So in other words, God was going to make Babylon a desert wilderness, never again to be inhabited. Basically, this, the nation and city would be completely ruined, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Babylon, as, as a nation, would cease to exist. Verse 41. Behold, a people is coming from the north and a great nation and many kings will be aroused from the remote parts of the earth. They seize their bow and javelin. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roars like the sea and they ride on horses, marshaled like a man for the battle against you, O daughter of Babylon. The king of Babylon has heard the report about them and his hands hang limp. Distress has gripped him agony like a woman in childbirth. I think we get the picture of that, this huge army, this whole, this coalition of nations coming against Babylon. When they attacked in their battle formation, they would just, they would sound like a roaring, stormy sea. And it would be such an imposing, intimidating thing <clears throat> that, and, and due to the reports of the invading army, the anguish and pain would grip the people as if they were women in labor. Uh, the king would be gripped with paralyzing fear and helplessness. Lastly, verse 44. Behold, one will come like a lion from the thicket of the Jordan to a perennially watered pasture. For in an instant, I will make them run away from it and whosoever is chosen, I will appoint over it. For who is like me, and who will summon me into court? And who then is the shepherd who can stand before me? We talked about that last week from, from chapter 49. Very similar to one of the other prophecies we read last week. The answer to those questions is no one. No one. 
Verse 45. Therefore, hear the plan of the Lord, which he has planned against Babylon, and his purposes, which he has purposed against the land of the Chaldees. Surely they will drag them off, even the little ones of the flock. Surely he will make their pasture desolate because of them. At the shout, Babylon has been seized, the earth is shaken, and an outcry is heard among the nations. So here, uh, the young are going to be dragged off and exiled. The land was going to be completely destroyed. And the reports of God's judgment against Babylon would be heard around the world and cause the entire nation to tremble. So in other words, the destruction of Babylon would have a far more profound effect on the surrounding nations than did the downfall of the nations that we covered last week. I mean, for Babylon to fall, as I said last week, comparing that to like the United States today, Babylon falling would be like the United States falling, would have a much more profound effect on the rest of the world than, say, if a country in South America were to collapse financially. And you can't help hearing in this that ring from Revelation 17, 18, and 18 when spiritual Babylon falls and the cry will be heard around the world and the nations of the earth would mourn and say, whoa, how could this happen? There's no doubt when they hear about what's going to happen to Babylon, knowing about the greatness of Babylon in this particular day, the nations, when the, when the word gets back to the nations, what happened to Babylon, they'll just be sh standing there dumbfounded. Really? How could that happen? Now, news didn't spread back then like it does today. We do have to keep in mind that there still was as much gossip going on. There still was as much, uh, there still was a, a desire to spread gossip but they just didn't have the ability to disseminate the information as quickly as we can today. I mean, if it happened today, tweets would go out, right? Be all over Facebook, all over social media, would be on the front page of the news. Imagine how long it would take for something that happened, let's say, in Istanbul, Turkey, right? Just the other day. I mean, it might take news like that months to get to us. It's possible, rather than minutes or even weeks. Imagine what it was like getting the news, you know, from uh, in the early 1900s, when there, we just we had newspapers and magazines. But imagine even before the days of a telephone, what that was like. But regardless of all of that, this cry that Babylon has been seized was going to reverberate. Now, chapter 51 is the longest chapter in the book of Jeremiah, and it continues the message of condemnation and ruin for Babylon. And it concludes with a word concerning a very important mission sent to Babylon by Jeremiah. We'll get into that, Lord willing, next week. Uh, so, there are a lot of parallels in chapter 51 that aren't in chapter 50. A lot of parallels to Babylon as we know it in the New Testament. What's said about Babylon in Revelation and in other places where it has more of a prophetic outlook of something than, other than just the city of Babylon in antiquity because of all the things that I mentioned earlier about Babylon being a code word for false religious systems. However, we'll get into that, Lord willing, next week, and I don't know that we'll get into Jeremiah 52, perhaps. We'll see. Let's stand. Isn't that amazing, though? do understand that for the Christian, prophecy is our friend. Prophecy is one of the primary ways that we can demonstrate that the Bible was given to us as the Word of God 
and that the Bible is true. Prophecy fulfilled is one of the surefire ways that you and I have and we're trying to defend our faith of saying, oh no, I, I know for a fact the Bible is true because of prophecy. That really is a key. These prophecies were given sometimes only decades before an event, sometimes only a few years, sometimes centuries. Look at the prophecies in Daniel of a Roman Empire and meticulous prophecies of, given by Daniel of Alexander the Great, of the Grecian Empire, and even some of the turmoil that was going to happen within his empire. A couple hundred years before it happened, that's the word of God. We know what's going to happen, don't we? When you see the world events going on right now, when you see the, the whole thing with the, the Brexit, the EU sort of dismantling, we see all these things going on in the world, we can look at world events and we know, you know, that may not be the catalyst, but we know something's going to go down. We know how, what's, what's going to materialize eventually. We know there's going to be a one world government. We know there's going to be the mark of the beast. We know that for certain because the, Bible, whoops, because the Bible teaches that. And so we understand what's coming. And God has always done that for us. He's always done that for his people. He lets them know what's going to happen so that they can be prepared, spiritually prepared. Daniel was prepared. Jeremiah was prepared. So many people were prepared. And it's just a matter of having our eyes opened and knowing what the text says and having our hearts detached, pulled away from the things of the world so that we can not get caught up when the destruction comes. Father in heaven, we pray that tonight you would help us to live in that prepared state. Your word tells us that we're to live in that prepared state. We're not to live in such a way that we think that our master is out on a long journey and that he won't be returning anytime soon. But we're to be living in such a way that we know that his return from his journey is imminent. It's upon us. And so, Lord, just like those five wise virgins, help us to keep oil in our lamps and our lamps burning brightly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.